Hello, everyone. My name is Marco Krohn. I'm the co-founder and CFO of Genesis Mining. Genesis Mining is one of the largest mining companies in the world. We are mining Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, and different other coins. So it's a large operation where we have now like tens of thousands of uh, GPUs and ASICs and our mining farms all over the world. And today, um, it's my pleasure to speak about mining, about opportunities in mining. Um, the first part will be an explanation, actually, why this process called mining exists at all. Why do we have mining in this decentralized system? And the second part will be about different coins and why it's an interesting opportunity to mine these coins. So, as I, as I said, the first part is about mining, an explanation why mining is in a decentralized system like Bitcoin is absolutely needed. The second part is then about opportunities in mining, um, Bitcoin mining, Ether mining, and Zcash mining. So, um, all of you know that Bitcoin is a decentralized system. Um, what, what this basically means is that we have thousands and thousands of computers, so-called nodes, in the system that store the whole ledger. The ledger is basically the list of all accounts and the number of bitcoins that are in this one account. So, for example, Alice has 5.3 bitcoins, Bob has 100 bitcoins. Of course, in the ledger there is not the clear name, it's the bitcoin address that you all know. That is a decentralized system because we have thousands of these nodes and these nodes need to synchronize all the time because new transactions are going into the system and maybe Alice sends one Bitcoin to Bob. Now, um, in a decentralized system, we have one big problem, namely how to achieve consensus. And I will explain that in a minute. Um, this is the reason, this is the number one reason why mining exists at all and um, it's I, when, when talking to people, not everyone realizes that mining is actually a result of um, this um, decentralized system. So, one thing I need to explain for that to explain why um, mining is important is what a double spend is. You probably have heard the name, so uh, let me explain it this way. In a centralized system, let's say, um, there is a bank, and I have a bank account with 100 US dollars. And let's say there was these two persons, Alice and Bob. And I write a check for Alice and tell Alice, here's a check over $100. And um, I write another check and over $100 again to Bob. So I'm spending my money, my, my account only has a balance of 100 US dollars. I'm spending my money twice. I'm giving one check to Alice and one check over 100 US dollars to Bob. That's of course illegal. Um, however, this is kind of what a double spend is. I'm trying to spend my money twice. How is that solved in a centralized system? In a centralized system, I have a bank and the bank knows, okay, Marco has 100 US dollars on his account. So let's assume Alice is the first one going to the bank, then Alice will be able to get the 100 US dollars and Bob won't. So um, the bank resolves this because there is one central entity, namely the bank, that knows all the account balances. But you can already imagine in a decentralized system that this is a little bit more problematic. So what would that mean in a decentralized system? Um, I have one Bitcoin in my account and I would like to spend it, and I'm now having these thousands of nodes, and each node knows, okay, um, I have one Bitcoin, and, and so on. However, if I now um, tell some nodes in the system I'm sending my Bitcoin to Alice, and some nodes in the Bitcoin system I'm sending one Bitcoin to Bob, then I have a problem in the network, because some part of the network will assume, oh, the Bitcoin is with Alice, and some part of the network will assume, oh, the Bitcoin is with Bob. How do I resolve this conflict? And this is what mining is about, um, reaching consensus in a distributed system. So let's see how this works. <clears throat> that, that's what I said. Mining is a distributed consensus system. Um, you probably have heard that mining is really, really difficult. It's about solving a very difficult problem. So. What, what is happening is that miners, these are basically the nodes in the network, um, miners, they get 
as input all these unconfirmed transactions. So whenever I'm doing a transaction, let's say send one Bitcoin to Alice or send one Bitcoin to Bob, this transaction is not immediately um, confirmed. Yeah? It's just staying there for a moment up to the point where it is confirmed by a miner. The miner, they select all these unconfirmed transactions they receive in one block. There is one important role, because now we have miners in this example that I said. Some miners will have this transaction, send one Bitcoin to Alice, and some of them have the transaction, send one Bitcoin to Bob. So um, all the miners will eventually get all the information, but some miners will receive the send one Bitcoin to Alice first, and later on the send one Bitcoin to Bob. And for the other ones, it's the other way around. So there is no time ordering. There is no time ordering like in a, uh, in a centralized system where one is going there and um, um, getting there with a check and getting the money. Time ordering in a decentralized system does not exist. So the miners, let's say the one that receives the transaction, send one Bitcoin to Alice first. Um, he will also later on see the transaction, send one Bitcoin to Bob. However, there is only one Bitcoin in the account, so the miner will conclude, okay, I've received the one to Alice first, the one to Bob comes later, and it's contradicting the other transaction, so I will not include this transaction in the block. So miners can take all the transactions, all the unconfirmed transactions, in one block. However, the important rule is the transactions in the block are not allowed to contradict each other. So the only, um, the only transaction I can choose is send one Bitcoin to Alice for these miners. Um, and, and then a block also contains a free parameter uh, called the nuns value. It's basically a big number which the miner can choose to an arbitrary value, whatever he likes. And I'll explain what, it is, uh, what this is about. So, the only thing a miner has to do, and it sounds quite easy, but this is extremely hard, is calculating the hash. The hash function is basically, um, is basically a function that takes some input, the nonce value plus the um, transactions, and the result is some number, some huge number, which is usually 256 bits. So that's why it's called char256. And depending on the nonce value, you remember um, I said there was a free parameter in there. Depending on the nonce value, whenever I change this nonce value a little bit, um, the end result for the miner, uh, the, the, the end result of the hash will be completely different. So um, the only thing the miner has to do is to find a nonce value such that the hash of um, the block is below a certain limit. That's the only task. So a miner is trying over and over, and I'll give an example, um, is trying over and over to solve this problem, to solve this one block. Let's take an example. The numbers are in reality much higher, but here for simplicity, uh, I think it's better to get the point. So this is a hash function, SHA256. Ignore this previous block for now, and the input in the hash function is a current block, which means all the unconfirmed transactions that the miner found or that the miner um, received, plus some nonce value. And in this example, the nonce value that is chosen, and it's completely free for the miner to choose whatever nonce value it wants to use, is 122. So um, the SHA or the, the, the hash function of of this expression then results in 1023. And in this example, the limit is 100. So the miner has to find a nonce value, in this case we tried 122, such that the result is smaller than a given threshold. That's the only thing a miner has to do. Sounds very simple. The problem is that this hash function um, has some properties which makes it really hard. I cannot kind of, um, from the hash function, I cannot easily uh, say, okay, let's use this nonce value and be ready. The only, the, the only way is, that is known 
is to try different nonce values to achieve the desired result. So there is no faster way um, to finding the right nonce value except for trying it out one by one. So in this example, um, the next one that is tried is 123. Okay, number is too high, still above 100, 124, still too high. And then nonce value 125 works. The end result in this case is the hash uh, is 35. And it doesn't matter whether the hash is eventually 1 or 99 or 35. The only thing that matters is that it's smaller than the threshold. Now, what do I have achieved by that? I have um, a problem which is extremely hard to solve. And with extremely hard to solve, I mean, right now, the network is trying 1.8 quintillion, yeah, I had to look up the word, um, hashes per second. So that's 1.8 exa hashes. So these numbers that I showed here are, in, in fact, really, really big. And the network is trying all the time to solve these blocks, which are extremely hard to solve. And um, another property of the hash, hash function is that whenever I change the nuns only a little bit, like from 123 to 124, the end result is completely different. So changing just one bit in this whole equation makes the um, hash completely different. And that means I really have to try each combination out in order to find a solution. If I find a solution, and if I solve this very, very hard problem as a miner, I can say I solved the block. And I will tell everyone in the network, I found a solution for the block. And this means I spent quite some time and resources to solve this, um, to, to find this solution. Um, and from that point on, if everyone has this new block with the confirmed transactions, with the ones which were approved by one miner, then all the miners and all the nodes in the network will accept this as a solution and as the status quo. So just to remind you, in the example I gave, I said, OK, I can try a double spend. I can send one Bitcoin to Alice and tell some other part of the network, send one Bitcoin to Bob. What is happening from this point on is that the miners try to solve um, the, the blocks. And some of them will see the transaction, send one Bitcoin to Alice first. And some of the miners will see the one Bitcoin to Bob transaction first. The network does not care um, whether the one or the other solution will eventually succeed. The important thing for, from the network's perspective is that only one solution will eventually survive. So assume that the miners of the branch um, send one Bitcoin to Alice, um, solve the block first. Then they will say, OK, we, we found a solution. We have the block here, and we'll distribute the block on the network. And then also the miners that before that try to solve the um, block with one Bitcoin to Bob, they will also receive this block, this new block, which was solved by the kind of by the Alice side, and they will say, "Oh, there is a new block available. Wonderful, we accept this as a new block." And by that, we have achieved consensus. This is the important part about mining: achieving consensus in a decentralized system. And there was no known solution before until Satoshi Nakamoto invented it, um, which is called proof of work. Proof of work because um, the consensus is achieved by this massive work. So um, I explained the main reason why mining exists at all. Achieve consensus in a decentralized system. That's the most important thing. Without mining, there would be no consensus and there would be no decentralized currency. The second thing is um, distribution of new coins. Otherwise, if, let's say, all the coins uh, at, at the beginning would be with one person, it would also be a little bit boring. Yeah, then 21 million coins would be sat with Satoshi. Um, now, with the mining process, um, I have the possibility to kind of issue new coins and give it to all the users, so there is kind of a more fair and more even distribution of coins among the players. Um, as you probably know, average Bitcoin block is found every 10 minutes. The system readjusts the difficulty 
that's this threshold I mentioned, which was in the previous example 100. And we adjust the difficulty in such a way that if there is new hash rate coming to the network, that the difficulty level will be increased. So it will be harder and harder to solve the problem. <clears throat> An important event that took place recently, that was the Bitcoin halving in uh, July 2016. So every four years, or to be more precise, every 210,000 blocks, the number of Bitcoins you can earn per block is reduced, and we are now um, at a block reward of 12.5 Bitcoins. So um, I already said that, um, that there is a huge hash rate already with uh, 1.8 exa hashes. And why are people doing all this effort? Well, the reason is that 12.5 Bitcoin per block with a value of about 700 US dollars means that every 10 minutes around 9,000 US dollars are produced by the network. That means about 1.3 million US dollars per day. So miners are very interested in receiving this block reward. Um, and in addition to that, they are interested in getting the, the fees for the transactions. That is the incentive why miners do this kind of job, because they want to earn new Bitcoins or new Ethereum and so on. Um, quite interesting, last time I was here in April 2016, um, we were still with a um, block reward of 25 Bitcoin. The value was 400 US dollars. So that means 1.4 million per day. So from that perspective, there is not much difference between the 1.3 and the 1.4. So the monetary incentive in terms of US dollars is more or less the same. In the, in the mining field, um, an evolution took place. Um, and in the beginning, Satoshi Nakamoto could mine bitcoins with his CPU. So he had a number of computers that's already known and could mine bitcoins with a CPU. But later on, a guy named, um, I, um, I forgot his name, um, uh, Laszlo, he invented GPU mining. So he saw that this problem, this hash function, uh, could be solved more easily on a GPU. So he used the GPU, and the GPU was about, let's say, 50 times faster than the CPU. From that point on, everyone was mining with the, with the GPU. Later on, then, people also used FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. And what we have basically since 2013 is ASICs, specialized hardware that is extremely fast in solving this one equation, namely the SHA function, the hash function, um, but is not usable for anything else. ASICs is basically the only thing you can use these days to mine Bitcoin. There is no other way. All the other solutions are way too slow. So what is the difference between home mining and large-scale mining? So home mining, and that's how we started as well, uh, basically looks like that. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you can do it to a certain scale, and it's a lot of fun, and you will learn a lot of things. But it's kind of getting messy at some point. So it means you buy hardware from retailers. Uh, it could be a GPU, could be a specialized um, um, ASIC here, for example, from Bitmain. Yeah, that's such an ASIC you can buy, and you can have it at your home. There are a number, number of problems related to that. Yeah, You need to import it. You may have to pay customs. You have to pay for electricity and so on. So that's kind of, and it doesn't scale very well at your home because these machines consume a lot of electricity. Um, second thing is, um, it's yeah. Usually, you want to use for GPUs standard hardware, and you will probably use the open source software that is available to run these machines. If you want to scale the whole thing up, uh, you will see okay, some of these things need a little bit different way of handling them. Um, what, what large-scale miners is, are doing is, like, like us, is um, buying directly from the manufacturer. And we don't buy like five machines, we buy like 5,000 machines. So we have huge, huge warehouses. For example, this one here is uh, our farm in Iceland, where we are mining um, Ethereum and Zcash. Zcash is also GPU mined. So what you can see in this picture here, all of it is GPU mining. So there are thousands and thousands of GPUs. 
<coughs> the second important thing is um, that you have infrastructure which works and scales very well. So you need huge warehouses, you need to take care of um, of cooling, which is extremely important because all of this hardware and all this electricity consumption is producing a, ma a massive amount of heat. So you need to take care of that. You also need to take care of machines that fail, that needs to be resetted. You have to have a good monitoring and maintenance team that knows what is happening with the farm. And um, the third thing is we have customized software uh, for running these farms, for running the machines which are a little bit more tweaked than the official versions. So in order to be efficient in the mining industry, and I will give you an example of what happens if you are not efficient, um, there are three important things to consider. Three things you need to be successful as a miner. Because the mining industry is a, is a very competitive field. If you don't kind of mine the Bitcoin, someone else will do it. And if you are too expensive, and if your electricity is too expensive, someone else will have cheaper electricity. So the three things are extremely efficient hardware. So you need the latest hardware, which means um, energy, the, the energy per hash should be as low as possible. The second thing is, that's what I mentioned before as well, is an in, in efficient infrastructure. So you want to ensure that your cooling works and that your farm is close to 100% uptime. And the third thing is you need cheap electricity. So if your electricity rate is, let's say, above 10 cent, um, you will not be able to compete at all. So this is an example of um, three, this is kind of an, a potential, or that's kind of a, um, potential example where you have three different miners. You have the highest efficient miner called 100%. You have someone who is medium efficient and the lowest efficient miner. So what is happening if all these three miners compete over time and the difficulty in the network increases? Um, the first one who will drop out is the lowest efficient miner. If there are only these three players, um, it will drop out very fast and by dropping out, it will reduce the overall hash rate in the network. So the other two, the medium efficient and highest efficient miners, at that point in time where he drops out, they will get a small benefit from that because they can now earn more coins, one competition less. The same happens if the medium efficient miner drops out. Then the one with the highest efficiency can get more or a bigger, bigger chunk of the cake and will earn more. So it's very, very important to be efficient in this market. Um, I talked a little bit about the, um, wh what is happening on the, on the uh, Bitcoin side and the hash rate. We have here again the different um, technological evolutions, namely from CPU mining over GPU mining, FPGAs, and the, the whole uh, industry is now dominated by ASICs. ASIC is the only way to mine efficiently bitcoins. On this scale, you see the hash rate in terahashes. You see it's a logarithmic scale. So this is um, a huge, huge increase of the overall hash rate. So we are now in a range of about 1.8 exahashes over here. As you can see, um, every time there was a a step from CPU to GPU, the hash rate increased uh, um, a lot. Yeah? So this last part is from the FPGA. GPU, FPGA were very close together. And then you see this massive increase of the hash rate again due to ASICs. However, we are now close to a technological limit. So um, the current state is about, uh, of this, for example, this Bitmain hardware and, and uh, other competition is 16 nanometers. So shrinking the hardware further is not much possible anymore. So you can improve with ASICs a little bit more, but there is no like factor of 10 or 20 or so av available anymore. So what you can see here is that the hash rate is kind of leveling out. Yeah? It's still increasing, but it's not increasing as much as during these times before. It's kind of getting more stable. So the important point here is that Bitcoin mining in particular, Bitcoin mining becomes more like an industry now. Yeah? It's not so much a technological field. 
It's more like a stable industry where big miners compete with each other. Um, this is one of our concepts for a different type of mining. So um, wh what you can do if you're mining, um, and let's say you have a GPU, you can mine different coins. Because several coins use similar algorithms. Yeah? Um, I can give an example. If you have a GPU, you can mine with this GPU, for example, Ethereum or Zcash. And one thing you can do is to mine these coins and then just uh, keep all these different altcoins in their wallet. Another thing you can potentially do is um, have a control unit that allocates your miners, in this example, the GPU, and it mines always the most profitable coin. If you always mine the most profitable coin, you can exchange it for the coin you actually want to have, for example, Bitcoin, and then keep the Bitcoin. So this is a way how you can get better efficiency. Um, sometimes you can see in the market that this is also done by other players. So for example, there was um, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And you can see that people were mining in such a way to increase their efficiency and to use the arbitrage between the different coins. So um, short summary of the uh, opportunities. Bitcoin mining is interesting because it's kind of now more stable than before. The price is relatively high. Uh, we have a limit of 21 million Bitcoins. So Bitcoin is a scarce resource and only about 25% of mining is left. So 75% of all Bitcoins that ever come into existence have already been mined. Um, Bitcoin has a market cap now of over 10 billion and it's kind of a safe haven. Yeah? So it's uh, something which is relatively stable compared to the past. Um, one thing I mentioned is the technology. The technology in Bitcoin mining is now coming to the point where it cannot be improved much further. I mean, there will be more generations of ASICs, but it will be like smaller steps. And uh, yeah, one, one point I should mention, which is also interesting, we have uh, this block size limit in place. So there is a one megabyte block size limit. You probably have heard about that. That also means that the space for transactions is um, scarce which in fact means that the transaction fees are increasing. So if you look at the charts, you see now that the miners that not only get the block reward, but also the transaction fees earn a little bit more due to the transaction fees. Um, second thing is Ethereum mining. Ethereum um, is still around 10 to $11. Um, Ethereum mining will change at one point in time to proof of stake. So they will use a different concept to proof of work. Um, so Ethereum is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, you can have different types of assets on the chain. Yeah, you know, probably heard of, about these different tokens like the web tokens, uh, Augur and so on. Uh, it has a complete, a Turing complete programming language and allows smart contracts. So it's an interesting coin anyway. Um, let's say in about half a year or a year, Ethereum will probably switch to proof of stake and mining will not be possible anymore. So due to that, the mining period for Ethereum is also coming to an end. And the last coin I want to mention is Zcash. Zcash can also be mined on a GPU. It's a rather new coin, which more or less copies all the features of Bitcoin, all, all the things that are good, also how the coins are distributed, and so on and so forth. Um, but it provides uh, advanced anonymity, something called a zero-knowledge snark. So and by that, it's kind of in Bitcoin, you know, from, from the first slide I showed you, you have all these Alice and Bobs, all these accounts. And with Zcash, it's kind of possible to hide who these, who these addresses are and how many coins on these addresses are. So it provides much better anonymity or fungibility in the end. Mining of Zcash just started. It's kind of just a couple of weeks ago that this coin is mineable at all. So this is actually something which is quite interesting because there is an opportunity to mine from the very beginning. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, Marco. It was the uh, best presentation about mining in my life. Yeah, really. 
Yeah, 20 minutes and you know, <laughs> you know all about mining. Uh, one, one moment, yeah. Um, do uh, anybody have a question? Yeah, great. Uh, hello. Uh, could you tell, please, w what will happen if uh, somebody, I don't know, person or corporation, uh, suddenly invent a uh, much more efficient uh, computer, like quantum computer? And what, what will happen with the network? Could, could they have 51% uh, or something um, suddenly? Yeah, the qu question is a good one, very good one. Um, what, what happens if, let's say, some player in the field invents a new technology? You mentioned quantum computing, which is superior to all existing technologies. And in fact, we, we had something like that for other coins. Yeah? So we, we have seen sometimes X11 is one of these examples. Um, all of them were mining with GPUs, but there were one or two players that all of a sudden had ASICs. Yeah? So you could see already in the, the network hash rate was going like crazy. Um, so they had an advantage over everyone else. The difficult part here is if, you, if you're kind of using, and, and you mentioned that, all the hash rate for your own, and you say you have this better technology, then, then you could potentially do a 51% attack. So let's say we would have invented something which is much superior in Bitcoin mining and would keep it for our own. At some point in time, someone would realize, OK, from the economics, it doesn't fit anymore. And there is one player probably having too much hash rate in the market. Um, that is kind of a risk, because if, if you are such a company that is doing that, it's not so good, actually, because um, if, if everyone realizes you have too much hash rate, there will be doubts uh, whether this coin is really safe, because it only relies on one player. So what most companies will do, they will mine a chunk for themselves and then start selling if there is not enough competition. And in X11, this is exactly what happened. So there is now like three companies that produce X11 ASIC miners and uh, distribute them. Of course, you could kind of try to hide your hash rate. That's to a certain extent also possible. But at the end of the day, it's probably the most profitable for the community and for the coin if you kind of share your technology. With respect now um, to quantum computing, so quantum computing, just, just to give the specific example, there is an uh, algorithm um, to do prime factor, um, how's it called, separation. Um, so you, you, can, you can attack certain things with a Shor algorithm. However, there is no known algorithm for a quantum computer to solve this uh, SHA-256 SHA algorithm. So, even if there is quantum computing available, I would be, let's say, relatively, relatively sure that um, the mining process itself will hold because there is no known algorithm at the moment. Thank you. Hey, Marco. Hi. Hey. Tone base. Um, so you guys started out as uh, Bitcoin mining, and then you added Ethereum mining as your next major one, and now you've added Zcash as the next major one. Okay, so it's a, like a two-part question. So one of them is you only have X number of resources. So how much of those resources were devoted to Ethereum when you started Ethereum mining? And how much of the Ethereum resources moved on to Zcash away from Ethereum, if you can answer that? And my other question is, at the end of the day, um, are you guys mining Zcash and Ethereum just to get Bitcoin? Because you're more competitive in mining them by selling them and getting to the Bitcoin. Good questions. Um, most of our resources are sold to clients. So the client at the end of the day owns the hardware or leases the hardware from us. Of course, we have some additional resources. And if you mention now GPUs, we have some additional GPUs which we are using for us. Um, for, the, for our clients, it's kind of, they were in the beginning and we are, we are going to change it, but they are kind of um, either mining Ethereum, and later on they were mining uh, Zcash. So people bought either Ethereum contracts or Zcash contracts. That's two different types, and we did not change it. Um, of course, it would be, let's say, economically beneficial to change some of the hash rate from, let's say, from Ethereum to Zcash. Because what you mentioned is basically you want to mine the most profitable coin. If you see Zcash is going up and has a high value and there is not so many miners on that, then you would move over some of the hash rate. Yeah? And that's what the market is also doing. So 
Um, you, you, could, you could perfectly see that, just to give this one example, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. When Ethereum Classic received some value on the market, miners were switching over in such a ratio that the ratio of the hash rate between Ether and Ether Classic was exactly matching the ratio of the prices between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. So as soon as there is an economic incentive to switch over, people will switch over. And this is what's happening. Very great. Just one very quick thing for, forget uh, ignoring Zcash for a second, uh, for much more mature assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, what is the average duration for an investor uh, to break even uh, in your structure when they buy? It's it's, it's very difficult to say. It depends on a number of factors. Um, and our contracts for Bitcoin and for Ethereum, because you mentioned them, are different. In Bitcoin, as I said, the um, industry has a phase transition in the sense that the technology you use these days will last for a much longer time. So ASIC machines are generally kind of specialized machines that last for a long period of time. That means, um, the, let's say, the, the horizon, how long you can mine, is only determined by the electricity cost. So as I showed you, this hash, hash chart is leveling out. So it's not increasing so much anymore. So it's just a matter of how long is the hardware you have and um, the electricity price is good enough to mine this coin. So our Bitcoin contracts are open-ended. So they, you can mine as long as you want. You just have to pay the electricity. And if the coins that you mine um, are less than what you would pay for the electricity on a daily basis, then the contract terminates. For GPU-based, it's a little bit different for two reasons. Um, the reason number one is that the GPU is, let's say, not exactly made for 24 hour, seven days purposes. So these are co actually consumer GPUs. They will not last as long as an ASIC. An ASIC is a specialized machine that is done for this purpose. A GPU, a normal consumer GPU, is not done for running for years in a an, in an warehouse under these conditions. So our GPU contracts are usually for one year. Um, and then it depends basically on the price and the development of the difficulty. Okay. Thank you very much, Marco. Давайте поблагодарим.